Hi, Sidra. Hello, how are you? I'm fine, thanks. And you? Yes, I'm fine, thank you. Nina, I'm here. But looking forward to it. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, yes. but at least so I'm you going can... to do a little bit different today. I'm going to do the history of Islamophobia first. Okay. It has to be a little bit different, doesn't it? I can't do exactly yeah. the same. And then we're going to cover the myths or the questions, okay. depending on what okay. questions you've got. Like, are Muslims terrorists? Then I'll talk to you about terrorism. <laughs> are Muslim women oppressed? <laughs> I'll talk to you about oppression, etc., etc. <laughs> that's interesting thank you so much for that that's okay <laughs> i did uh send this out to a few counselors who work is it okay yeah hi everybody hi ross hi amira good afternoon good afternoon good afternoon yeah. hello nina you're... hi joan hi pam j hi nina hi joan you are hi joan yeah very well thanks well, i think we can we can start now so, hi everyone Good afternoon and thank you for joining us today. For those of you who don't know me, I'm not sure how many people don't know me here. I, I think I can see some new names or faces here. My name is Nina Suri and I'm the chair of the Staff Aid Forum. Today I've got with me Sidra, who is um, one of the Muslim chaplains in Havering um, Interfaith um, Forum uh, in the community. Uh, so she is going to be um, presenting to us today. So over to you, Sidra. Hi. Go on, guess. Okay, thank you very Hello. much, everybody, for inviting me today in Is uh, Islamophobia Awareness Week for Haven Council. I'm going to try sharing my PowerPoint. Okay. Now, let's look at Islamophobia. That word, did you know, came about just after 9-11. And that word, Islamophobia, was actually there to create hate. Who can tell me what the word phobia actually means? Anybody? I'm going to try and do this as, as interactive as possible. What does the word fear phobia of? mean? Pardon? A fear of? A fear, fear of. Good, good. Well done, whoever that was. Fear of. Okay. And Islam means peace. So Islamophobia actually literally means fear of Islam. So that word really in my books needs to change and it needs to be something else like anti-Semitism. Maybe it needs to be anti-Islam, something like that. But Islamophobia, just that word actually creates fear in people. So last time's talk, I did all about questions on things that create fear about Islam. This time, I'm actually changing uh, it a little bit. I'm doing that part as well. But as I'm going to start off the talk with the history of faith hate, Islamic hate in um, history, how it all started. Why did people start hating Islam? So this chart here tells you, talks to you about how Islam actually started. Um, and Islam came after the two monotheistic religions. And the fact that it came after Judea Judaism and Christianity created hate and people thought of Islam as a rivalry religion because it came after those two religions and in a way updated those two religions. And um, Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, was actually seen as an antichrist in a lot of books and things he was written down as the antichrist that he's come and he's taken over now and the antichrist is here where both of those religions were awaiting antichrist to come as well so it wasn't looking good even though prophet muhammad peace be upon him he came to put the world to rights to show good things so all the women that were being oppressed he changed that so all these things about women being oppressed was happening before Islam came. Baby girls were being buried alive. There was sexual slavery, nudity, persecution of women. There was women were traded and married off as part of business deals. They could not inherit own land property. They never had a sane lawmaking. But when Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came, he gave women status and rights and he changed all of that. He also, did you know, put a stop to all the war 
and all the problems between the different tribes, the class and the color discrimination, the fear and terror that was going on, the exploitation that was going on of slaves, barbarism and ruthlessness. There was darkness and ignorance and illiteracy, actually, that was going on before. And Prophet Muhammad actually put a end to that as well. Uh, there was kindness and mercy afterwards, justice and fairness, peace and security, love and brotherhood. He taught us to respect all religions and he preached to us to set free the captives of war and prisoners and slaves. And he gave animal rights as well, right down to animals. So all of these things changed when Islam came. So all these bad things you hear about Islam is all really to create it showcase it as a terrorist religion but we will cover some of those things as well so when islam came it spread through to europe and this is actually the timeline so it was actually in 750 a.d when islam spread to europe into england at the seashores and the first thing that happened was when the tradesmen came over to sell all their perfume spices clothes gold jewelry they were not allowed to stay in Britain. So they were actually treated like the homeless and they were only allowed to stay, uh, you know, just until their goods are sold and then they would then be sent back to um, their homelands again. They were not allowed to stay there. And these were mainly the more traders. Then as we go down the timeline, the Crusades happen. Now, the Crusades are actually remembered a lot at the moment with all this Palestine conflict, Israeli conflict that's going on, which we can talk a little bit about today, if anybody wants me to. And there was a lot of friction between Christians and Muslims. Slaudin, who is actually a international hero, was portrayed really badly in European history. Yet he actually created peace in those Crusades, if you look at the authentic te texts. Um, when I was at school, Slaudin was also uh, showcased as a really, really bad figure. But it's only later on when I looked into his history that we found out that he wasn't really all that bad at all. He was only trying to create peace and harmony between all the faiths. One of the things that was traded across Britain was actually the um, Quran and the first copies of the Quran were taken into Britain and the Quran was changed. It was actually changed into English and words were taken out and different words were put in and then they were actually then distributed across England to create hate. So this is one of the bad Islamophobic acts that took place. This information is actually from an Islamic exhibition from the British Library. And there was another one in the British Museum as well uh, called The Golden Age of Islam. And it talks to you about all of those. So everything that I talk about is all authentic, all very authentic information taken from the museums in Britain. Um, so this is actually the very first translation of the Quran, which was not translated properly. And little bits were taken out, little bits were expanded on, which were taken out of context. And the people that read those things didn't know the context in which they were revealed. It's a little bit like terrorists nowadays. The terrorists that do exist, they take out things to suit themselves and then they spread the knowledge, um, which is wrong. And they use it to get everything for themselves in terms of land, power and money. That's what terrorism is really about, gaining land, power and money. So that's one of the other things that happened. Anybody who did become Muslim, now this was the very first Englishman who converted to Islam. He actually um, converted to um, Islam and he wasn't allowed to tell anybody he was Muslim, otherwise he would be killed. So... In those days, they pretended they had turned Turk. So they put a turban on and pretended they were Turkish. The Ottoman Empire was actually quite respected. So they would pretend they've become a Turk and become, you know, 
uh, a bit more then accepted because the Ottoman Empire was accepted. So many more actually converted through the trading where they met Muslims and then they became Muslim themselves. And um, they then uh, would then pretend that they are, have become Turk. This was actually a very famous captain of a ship, of a trades ship. And uh, he was Captain John Ward of Kent. He's an English pirate based in Morocco. He converted to Islam and became Yusuf Rees. Um, I don't know if anybody has seen the film uh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. Yes? So who can tell me what the famous captain is in? <laughs> in Pirates of the Caribbean. Anybody? The Captain Jack Sparrow. Yes, well done. So did you know this was actually... Uh, based on Islam, this is actually Captain Jack Sparrow, uh, who was actually a Muslim and he actually traded along the shores of Morocco um, and brought the trades into Britain. But did you know that once he became Muslim, he was kicked out of England completely and he had to go and live um, in a foreign land. OK, so he was actually had to live in Morocco. He was not allowed in Tunisia either. Even the Tunisians said he's not allowed here either. So it was really treated badly if they became Muslim. The next chart is a very important one. This is actually a 1641 document. And it talks to you about all the religions that were apparent in London at the time. And all of the religions in London are all referred to as um, devilish except for the first, which is Protestants. So you can have a look at that list there. And um, it actually refers to a sect of Mahometans being discovered here in London. Um, and this is actually, this article is taken again from the British Museum. So you should actually see the word Mahometans there, which I think is the eighth one down from that list. Yeah, so all the religions, it wasn't just Islam, but all the other religions, apart from Protestants, were actually classed as most damnable and devilish. That's what it says in that document. OK, did you know there were 29 sects, different sects of different religions, either within Christianity or other religions? Then the slave trade happens. And I don't know if anybody has seen the film Roots. What a brilliant film that is, Roots. And um, that film actually was very authentic and it showed actually 85 to 90 percent of the slaves were originally Muslim who came over from Africa, either into Britain or into the whole world. They went into the whole world. And they were treated very, very badly. They were unpaid. They were um, forced as well to eat pork. They were, um, there was racial discrimination. Um, some of the ladies were raped. There was all sorts. We all should know really a little bit about that history. When I went to America recently, I went to a black history museum and there, uh, it was quite awful. I came out actually quite angry, even though I'm not black. I came out very, very angry out of that uh, museum because when I read about the way those uh, slaves were treated, it, it just made me quite angry. Um, okay, so let's move down the timeline. And we come to this very important person. He was actually a revert to Islam, convert, William Henry Quilliam. He was the first person who actually built a mosque in Britain. And he was treated really, really badly, even though he tried to really fuse all the different religions and form peace. And he was actually built a mosque for the whole of Britain. So I'm now going to put on a video if you cannot hear the video, please do let me know because I'm not used to Teams and it's a BBC video. OK, let's put that on. 
A century ago, Liverpool was a flourishing port and Muslim sailors from India and the Far East would have been regular visitors. This rather faded terraced house in a Liverpool suburb is where this forgotten story of Islam begins. Although it doesn't look much now, in the 19th century, this was the first mosque in England. In 1889, the house was bought by a man named Abdullah Henry Quilliam. Quilliam was a Victorian gentleman, but he was also a Muslim convert. A religious innovator who fought to change preconceptions of Islam at a time when society found it frightening and alien. And it was here that he set about doing it. Against the odds, Quilliam established this not only as a mosque, but as a flourishing Muslim institute with its own printing press and an orphanage. It was the center of Islam, not just for Liverpool, but for the whole of Britain. But this public display of devotion to Islam immediately put him on a collision course with both the Christian hierarchy and the people of Liverpool. William faced hostility uh, right from the very beginning. They were attacked on a number of occasions. You get pig's heads being thrown into the mosque. They would congregate mobs outside the mosque who would start jeering. It raised hackles. There's no doubt about that. In the face of such opposition, the mosque seemed to have an uneasy future. Quilliam's genius was to analyze why Victorians despised Islam and begin to address their prejudice. Quilliam knew that one of the key criticisms against Islam was that it was narrow-minded. It didn't embrace the new scientific discoveries of the 19th century. These lectures met such criticisms head-on. So, so he's presenting Islam in a very rational way that's going to appeal, in, in a sense, to the new scientific consciousness um, of Victorian Britain. These events drew converts. And as numbers grew, so did Quilliam's profile. But just as Quilliam was at the height of his success, everything changed. In June 1908, he and his eldest son left on what was supposed to be a six-week trip to Istanbul. No one knows exactly why, but without any warning, they mysteriously disappeared. After some months, his youngest son, who stays behind, begins to dismantle everything that Abdullah Quilliam had created. The properties are sold um, and effectively the Liverpool Muslim community comes to an end. With the disintegration of Quilliam's mosque, the outlook for Islam in Britain appeared uncertain. Okay, I'm hoping that everybody could actually um hear that and uh, now we'll move on to the next part in the timeline so this is now coming up to queen victoria's era and this was actually a man called um, abdul kareem he was actually did you know the indian secretary to queen victoria and she treated him really really nicely um, she actually treated him better than her own son. Some of you may have seen the film Victoria and Abdul, and his story is in there. And um, as soon as Queen Victoria passed away, he was treated really badly and he was shipped back to India immediately. Um, he was not allowed to live in England anymore. Okay, right, we're going to fast forward now to... This era, 1965, where um, there was eventually a law against race hate crime because there was a lot of race hate going on at the time. And however, there was no law against faith hate crime. And a lot of Muslims are of color. So they show, you know, they, you know, when you look at them, their skin color is colored. Um, and uh, 
So people then used that an excuse then to attack Muslims. Although there was a race hate crime law in place, there wasn't a faith hate crime law in place. And there still isn't for Islam, which we can talk about later. So people then used this as an excuse then to hate Muslims. There was lots and lots of National Front attacks, BMP attacks, skinheads. This is all the era of the 70s, which Muslims actually got the most, according to journals. And then later on in the 80s, who knows about the greatest genocide that was against the Muslims on European soil? Does anybody know? Anybody? Shebrenica. Yes, good. Well done. Well done. Excellent answer there. So this is actually um, a scene from all the boys and men, the husbands and the boys, the sons who were killed. Did you know that there were seven to eight thousand Muslim men and boys were killed by the Bosnian Serbs um, that had been designated a United Nations safe haven? the worst atrocity that ever took place on European soil. And uh, it's very, very sad, but there were actually thousands, thousands of Muslim men and boys died, which then led to a lot of widows. Um, and uh, a lot actually did come into Britain then. So Britain was actually quite kind and let some of the, them in as refugees. Um, and then the next biggest atrocity happened in 2001. Does anybody know which one that one is? And this one happened in front of most of our eyes. 2001. The one, the one Iraq, was it? Was that that one the Iraq war? Was it the start of that? No. Nope. 9-11. 9-11. Good. Somebody said 9-11. Well done. 9-11 was the biggest atrocity that could have happened, really. And unfortunately, Muslims were tarnished even though we believe it wasn't Muslims who did it, because they could not have been Muslims if they did that atrocity. So that then created huge Islamophobia that Muslims are terrorists and they like to kill. Okay, so we are going to start off by dispelling that myth first. Okay, uh, and uh, then we're going to cover all the other myths and you can ask me whatever you like. Whichever question you ask me, I will give you the answer according to what Islam says. OK, so first of all, that atrocity that happened was very, very wrong, because if anyone kills an innocent person, it is as if he has killed the whole of mankind in Islam. And did you know if anyone saves a life, it is as if he has saved the whole of mankind. That is what it says in our religion. Suicide bombing is not allowed for two reasons. Does anybody know why, that, what the two reasons are why suicide bombing is not allowed in Islam? Why are we not allowed to kill ourselves? I'm not sure, has it got anything to do with like a commandment that Allah says thou shalt not kill? Like Yes, that is one, but faith. why? Why are we not allowed to kill ourselves? Who gives us life? God. God. Good, well done. Good, well done, <laughs> Werner. Um, God gives us life, okay? So it mm, is not in our life. hands then to end it. It's mm. up to God when he ends our life. So we actually, in our religion, we are a firm believer of destiny. So we believe that we need to die if Allah wants us to, okay? So that's the first reason why suicide bombing is not allowed. And the second one is that they that that we are killing innocent people if we suicide bomb it's not just mm -hmm. us we're killing we're killing others as well so that is very very wrong to do that and i already spoke on my earlier slide that if you kill one person that killing the whole of mankind so how is that right then okay so there is definitely a big problem here and the context i will talk to you about in a minute on which terrorists do that but first of all extremism is very very wrong as well prophet muhammad peace upon him pronounced a firm warning never be extreme regarding religion many nations have been destroyed before before you only because of extremism in religion always follow the middle way 
the middle path. And that is actually a well-known saying, follow the middle path. Okay. And also do not cause harm, nor respond to harm with harm. And if you think about it, terrorism has no religion because there is not a single religion in this world that will tell you to kill. You can look at any religion. It's all about peace and harmony. And terrorism has no religion. And if there is a such thing as ISIS or all of the others that cause the problems, don't forget that they have also killed over 100,000 Muslims. Where is all the terrorism taking place? It took place in Iraq, Afghanistan. Well, are they not killing Muslims as well? Are there not Muslims in Iraq and Afghanistan? So how can they be Muslims then if they are killing Muslims? So we believe they're not Muslims. It's all about land, power and money. Okay. And extremism can happen in any religion. Can anybody tell me some extremists within, for example, Christianity, a famous big gang? Showed them in the film Roots, actually. Ku Klux Klan. Good. That's a brilliant answer. Well done. Ku Klux Klan were actually Christians. And look at how many murders they did. Nobody actually thinks of them as Christian because that's bad. Now, what about Hitler? Was that not genocide, what Hitler did? How bad was Hitler in the Holocaust? But did you know he was a practicing, well, he was supposed to be a so-called practicing Christian. But he wasn't according to Christians because he was bad. And even Christianity tells you not to kill. Judaism tells you not to kill. So all of these people, really, they're after power, land and money. That's what the real agenda is about. It's politics. It's not about the religion or the people. But unfortunately, people then think of them as Muslims. And then there's this thing about portraying or painting the whole religion like that. that that's what it must be like. OK, so terrorists can be any ethnicity and any religion. Muslims are not the face of terrorism. They are not a threat. Terrorists are. OK, and then the way that the story is portrayed is a very big problem. And this is actually a fact. So this chart is quite interesting on uh, how the media actually, there's been reports about this. I'm not just making it up. There's media reports on how the terrorist story is told. OK, so. Um, if you're an Arab, you're definitely a terrorist. If you're black, and I actually did this very recently on some training I did for a drug therapy company, they are then portrayed as a thug. And if you're somebody's white, then it's mental illness, put down to mental illness. So the way the media portrays it always has an impact on Islam. And I have had firsthand experience about trying to get myself in the papers for good things. And I've been told by the newspaper chair that uh, good news is no news. In other words, if I'd sold them a story about terrorism, it would get in the paper because that's what sells the papers, but good news doesn't. The other problem we have is that we have no freedom of speech, really. There is no law that protects Muslims no law whatsoever so people can say what they like about islam and we have to bear it and i'm looking at charlie hebdo magazines here they would create uh upset in a lot of muslims but we couldn't say anything about it yet if the same magazines were written about another faith they may be protected so anti-semitism is a law in this country. There is also a law to protect um, the race of Sikhs as well. But however, at the moment, as it stands, there is no law to protect Muslims, which means people can say what they like about Islam and we have to stay quiet and just get upset within ourselves. So that's the way it stands at the moment. Okay, 
What other is a very big Islamophobic word within the Western world begins with a J? The big J word. Anybody? Jihad. Good. Well done. We've got some really, really intelligent, clever people actually on this um, on this team's call. So well done. Very happy with that answer. By the way, a lot of people don't get that answer. So jihad. This is a very big, misunderstood and overused word. It literally, did you know, means struggle. So some of us struggled to get onto teams today. Some of us struggled to bring out time in our busy, busy lives to get on this talk today. Yes. Um, some of us are not working and we took busy time out of our home schedule to get on here today. That's our, did you know that is what jihad just literally means struggle. So even smiling in tough moments is jihad. Keeping patient in hard times is jihad. Struggling for good deeds is jihad, like praying. Taking care of your old parents, that's our, my jihad at the moment, is going up and down London looking after my parents. Forgiving is jihad. Jihad is not what the media shows, but what the Quran says, it's to strive and struggle. And I have got actually a non-Muslim person talking about jihad on this video, and she's going to talk to you about what jihad actually means, the real word. Jihad in the news is often translated to mean holy war, but holy and war are both English words with Latin origins, so it probably doesn't mean exactly that. According to Google Translate, the individual words exist separately in Arabic. So what is jihad? Does it refer to a set of conflicts, like how the Crusades refer to a set of Christian holy wars? Nope, it does not. So why do they need the extra word jihad to describe a holy war? Does it even mean holy war at all? Well, the short answer is no. What jihad really means is struggle. It's a major religious duty that many consider to be the unofficial sixth pillar of Islam, right below self-control, giving to the poor, and visiting Mecca. Technically, jihad means a struggle in the way of Allah. Fringe radical militant groups think that attacking the West is part of that struggle, but the majority of Muslims don't. Most of them are actually opposed to using the word jihad in that way because it associates the word with terrorism. So what does jihad mean to them? Well, in Islam, there are two types of jihad, the outer and the inner. The outer is the kind that defends Islam against outside aggression, like they did in the Crusades. The inner represents the internal spiritual struggle to seek self-improvement in the way of Allah. So basically, it's the struggle to be a better Muslim, both spiritually and in practice. The following passage, which is from a highly debated Islamic text called the Hadith, sums it up pretty nicely. In it, Muhammad says to a band of returning warriors who have come from the lesser jihad to the greater jihad, the striving of a servant of Allah against his own desires. So despite the negative attention it gets, jihad can refer to some really wonderful things. There's even a website called myjihad.org that highlights good jihads, and it's part of an entire online movement devoted to taking the word back from Islamic extremists. Even Twitter has gotten in on it with a hashtag myjihad, where people tweet about their good deeds or positive struggles to help better themselves and their communities. Like, my jihad is to balance work and family life. My jihad is to challenge society norms and work towards improving our culture. My jihad is to keep the air in my country clean. And finally, my jihad is trying to appreciate the jihad in a place where the jihad is misunderstood. So see, it's really not as scary a word as you might think. It doesn't mean holy war, and if that hashtag is any indication, it has the power to change the world. Okay, did you know that jihad is not, repeat, not the sixth pillar of Islam? That's another big taboo out there. There's only five pillars of Islam, and jihad is not one of them. That is actually just made up, again, to create Islamophobia. Okay? Um... Now, the media, I did mention the media a little bit earlier on. This is actually a very powerful picture. The media doesn't always give the full picture, okay? They only give little bits of the information, which is to create terror and also to increase their ratings of their programs. If you think about any soap opera, let's take EastEnders. I don't watch EastEnders, but you know, in the olden days, you know, Dirty Den. Do you remember all that saga that happened? 
when that went in there, all of a sudden the ratings went really high for EastEnders. Who remembers Dallas and who shot JR? <laughs> as soon as that headline went out, Dallas ratings went up huge. So bad sells papers and newspapers, good doesn't. People don't want to hear lovely, wonderful stories. They want to hear shocker stories. Okay, so Islam is sometimes intentionally misrepresented. Some politicians, religious leaders and media have found an idle scapegoat in Islam. And that is actually a, a fact. And a, a tabloid guide to reporting a gunman story, a uh, related story, is a Muslim shooter. This is how it's reported. Billion Muslims held responsible. A black shooter, it says um, it's related then to violence. And then a professional shooter's a national hero, like soldiers. And a white shooter is normally portrayed as a lone wolf. Okay, you can have a look at some of these storylines when they come out next. Uh, one really classic example very recently was there was a Syrian man and he killed somebody. And all of a sudden it was all over the news that he's a Muslim terrorist. Then all of a sudden it came out that he was Christian and all of a sudden he was off the news and nobody heard anything again. That actually happened very recently. Um, so by associating... Islam with inhumane acts of a handful, they are successfully driving larger number of people to vote for them, read their newspapers, and watch their television programs. Okay, right. Are there any questions now which you would like answered? Islamophobic questions, because I have got the answers to all of them. Anything you like that you have heard of, which you would like clarified on that you've heard about Islamophobia, which increases your Islamophobia, if you like. You, you've sort of just covered um, most of the most of the things. It's interesting to know some of the things you just mentioned. So, yeah. OK, what about women being oppressed? Have you heard of that one? Shall I start the ball rolling with some more? Yeah. Well, Muslim women, around Muslim women being oppressed. Yes. Let's do that one first then. Yeah, we can, yeah. So Muslim women already explained war oppressed before Islam came. But once Prophet Muhammad came, all these things that you see on the left were changed. And women were given status and rights, which were actually given to women in the West much, much later. So here are some of them. So according to the Quran, men and women are both equal before God. And did you know both of them are created to worship God and men like women are rewarded for a righteously led life. And women were given specific rights, actually, which elevates them in Islam. So did you know they are given the right to education? Now, a lot of people ask me this question that how comes in Afghanistan the women are not allowed to be educated if in your religion it says women can be educated. The reason is it's all political. If women are educated, they're going to get into parliament and they're going to rule the land. But the men want to rule politics and rule the land so they don't let women get in in the first place. So this is a plot in a way to stop women getting up to the high positions. So is this a man-made rule or is this the, re the religion, everybody? Is this a man-made? Man-made. Man man Good, man it's man-made. Now, something really important for people to understand is that in all countries, the parliament is separate from the religion. If you look at England, the parliamentary laws are not based on religious laws. They are based on... Um, man man-made laws and the religion the church of england is separate isn't it and did you know it's the same in our lands the laws that are made by the government are separate from the laws which um are religious laws it used to be all together at one stage even in britain but it's not anymore so if somebody stops you driving in saudi arabia 
the previous king did, everybody thought that was the religion. And then the next king came and he all of a sudden allowed women to drive. So if that was the religion, how comes women are allowed to drive now? It doesn't make sense. So obviously it was a man-made law, wasn't it? Okay, does that make sense? So we will have questions at the end as well, but we're just covering all the Islamophobic questions first. They are allowed to work, okay? And they are allowed to keep their own money. Did you know right from the beginning, women are allowed to keep their own money and it is actually in English law much much later on in the last hundred or so years when the feminist movement happened that women were allowed to keep their money before that did you know that um, all their money were automatically went to their husbands in Britain and did you know it's only in the 70s that women were allowed to have their own credit card? And I know that from a police officer who told me. Did you know that in Islam, you were allowed to inherit, own and sell property? So you had a right to a will as well for the first time um, in Islam. All of this happened in the last hundred years after the feminist movement in Britain, where property anything inherited went automatically to the men. Did you know 1400 years ago, women were allowed to vote for the next leader after Prophet Muhammad passed away. We all know about the suffragette movement in Britain, where how much did Emily Pankhurst have to go through? You just got to watch that film Suffragette to see all the hardships she went through to get to vote. And in there, there is a scene where her husband beat her black and blue, told her to sit down quietly and stop doing all these, all these movements. And she was in prison as well for a while, wasn't she? Um, despite what you hear, all these forced marriages and stuff is not Islam. It's based on money and land to keep it in the family, which used to happen in aristocratic movements in Britain as well. And even within the royal family, where you only marry within the royal family to keep the name and the land and the status in the family. But did you know Prophet Muhammad, he chose his own wife, Khadija. Khadija actually chose him. So there's that stigma gone as well. Um, did you know to stop women being used, which was happening before Islam, they were being used for their money. Um, you know, I'll marry you if your dad can give me 100 camels was going on kind of thing. The dowry system was all abolished. And did you know when a woman gets married, it's the man that has to give her money and she can actually request. I'd like £10,000, please. <laughs> <laughs> and then I will marry others. I'm not going to do it. And she's allowed to marry the highest bidder as well. That's the other way around is to stop women being used. And did you know that if she was from a rich household and she had a pre-married standard of living, it's up to the husband to try and keep that standard of living, but only obviously if he's got the means to do that. We have so many privileges that men are scared of us. <laughs> and did you know that for the first time in history, women were allowed to divorce and get out of difficult marriages? Uh, before this, everybody knows Henry VIII in his days, he wasn't allowed to divorce. So what did he do? He became head of the church, head of Church of England, and then he could divorce to marry somebody else who he loved. But in Islam, it was the first religion to allow divorce. And we even have advantages over men as well. Okay, a lot of people think we're oppressed because of the way we are dressed. But did you know, in all religions, all religions, women are expected to dress modestly, especially if you're showing yourself as a practicing woman, then you're like a nun. So if you look at Mary, Jesus's mum, you always see her practicing with a headscarf on. And women in Britain also used to cover. Let's look at this BBC programme. What's fascinating is the girls' hairs all covered. 
so women do not show long hair. So you see the girls, the shawls, are completely covering them, and you don't see their hair at all, you see their faces. There's all this debate now about the hijab and about women covering their hair, and we forget that, we've lost that as part of our culture. Like hundreds of years ago, you wouldn't walk out in the streets of Lancashire with your hair down. Okay, so that is actually a BBC programme that came on. So these are all the rights which Muslim women got when Islam came. So all that stuff you hear about women being oppressed is wrong, completely wrong. Okay, it's not correct. Um, they were given rights way before the westernised world uh, got those rights. Did you know that it was only until the 60s that countries like America, where women were allowed to vote, so they were even more behind. Okay, any more questions, everybody? What other questions can you think of that you've always wanted to know the truth? Anything else? Can I mention an observation around yeah. terrorism? Yes, you can. Uh, yes. My observation of the media is that uh, when there is a Muslim name or a Muslim face, it's very quickly put onto the news, the name and the face, yeah. and then suspected terrorism. So the audience assumed it is terrorism uh, or alleged terrorism, that suspected or alleged dead yeah. to put a bit of probability into it. In Nottingham, a, a man killed uh, three people two, three months ago in Nottingham, students at university. And uh, I was very keenly listening to it, how it's treated by the media, BBC and ITV. And police said, oh, we are not releasing any details at the moment. And uh, they said, we're not, we're keeping our options open for labeling. Two, three days later, uh, there was still no news, but four or five days later, uh, they mentioned the name and uh, another day later, they showed a picture of the person who did the, it was a European person or a non-Muslim person, but it's just the way they jump to conclusions, you know, when it's crime done by a Muslim person, they're labelled very quickly. When it's a white person, the labelling is not done. Yes, correct. And that's all I observe. Correct, yes. The way um, the media works. Yes, that's a very valid point, and that actually strengthens what I said earlier as well. So well done for that. Mm. Um, okay, uh, so we were covering question and answers, but I will put up the PowerPoint if I need to explain anything again, because I've got all the questions answered. Okay, anybody else? Any other questions? Yeah, can I ask one? Um, yes. Just around... Um, to kind of not drinking of alcohol and, and pork. I never, I've had a few conversations with people before, but um, don't really fully understand the, the links to that. So yes, could... I can explain. So Thank first you. of all, um, people were allowed to drink up to Jesus times. We know Jesus drank wine. It was a little bit like grape juice in those days, but Jesus never got drunk. And he always said, drink, but don't get drunk. Okay. By the time Islam came, people were drinking and they were getting drunk. And um, people were praying and they were drunk um, and they were changing the words of God. So once um, Islam came, then God banned it completely. He said, you were asked to drink, but don't get drunk. But you did drink and you did get drunk, so I'm banning it completely. So that's when the banning of alcohol came, which was a lot more stronger, the wine was, by the time Islam came. The one about the uh, pig is actually within the uh, Jewish scriptures as well, where it asks you not to um, eat meat of the swine, for the meat of the swine is unclean for you. Now, this is actually to protect our health, because uh, pork or, or, or pigs, they actually are scavengers and they actually eat uh, their own uh, excreta and things like that as well, which means that they've got a lot of urea in their skins and bodies. And when we eat then um, those products, pig products of any kind, then uh, it's coming into us as well, uh, those products are. Um, so that's why we have been prohibited from eating meat of the swine. So that includes pork, ham, 
you know, all of those things. And it's the same with the Jewish tradition. So we're just carrying on that message. Okay. I hope that's answered your question. Yes, it has. Thank we've, you. we've got one more person. Joanna's got a question. Joanna, next, what was your question? Uh, it was just about having a bit of explanation about Sharia law. Yes, yes. And how um, that impacts women. Yes. Now, Sharia law is a set of laws that is in the Quran, just like the Bible has Sharia law, uh, well, not Sharia law, but law oh, in there. And uh, the Torah has laws as well. Did you know that the laws in the previous two scriptures were a lot more stricter and they're a lot less in the Quran? OK, and some of those laws are there to protect us. They are to also as a deterrent to stop that sin happening in the first place. So, for example, I'll give you some examples, but the rest, Joanna, you can let me know and I can clarify. So one of them is in the it says if you steal something, chop their hands off. Did you know that is also in the Bible? Because I've been to the the London dungeons. OK. And did you know when the London dungeons opened, they were operating according to the laws of the Bible. And as you go in, there's a big plaque and it says, if you steal a loaf of bread, thou hands shall be chopped off. So that is there as a deterrent. And in countries where that part of the Sharia law is there, nobody steals. Saudi Arabia is one of them. They are very, very low crime rates because people are scared that their hands are going to get chopped off. But it's a deterrent to stop that awful sin happening in the first place, that crime happening in the first place. If you knew your hands are going to get chopped off, you wouldn't dare steal anything, would you? Yeah, but the West views that as inhumane, don't they? They do, but it doesn't happen in the first place. And it also, you're very right, in nowadays it is, because the laws here have changed. Because prison laws are not based on Christian laws. Do you understand? There's a big, yeah, big I mean. difference. But if you read the Bible and in there you think, oh my God, you know, it, all, it is all there. But it's the parliamentary laws have changed separate from the Church of England, which the royal family are in charge of. Okay? And in yeah. our home countries... <laughs> the, the parliamentary laws are taking some bits of Sharia law that suits them, them yeah. yeah, but not all. There's not a single country out there that uses the whole of Sharia law. So if I was to ask you in terms of when a, when a woman, maybe it's Saudi Arabian law, they're like, mm -hmm. but when a woman wants to divorce her husband, she they have to go through... Um, uh, I'm not sure whether you call them your, your your high sort of like priests or whatever to go through Sharia law to to actually be able to for them to get divorced. Kind of heard stories about that. Right. <clears throat> so, did you know for any divorce, you tell me in Britain, you have to go through court. Even if yeah. a man <laughs> exactly, <clears throat> even yeah. if a man has to divorce, do you not need witnesses? Do you not need to go through any mom? Yeah. Yeah. Like you need to go through an imam to get married, you need to go through an imam to get divorced. Right? How legal is that in this country? Okay, this country, there's no Sharia law. And did you know, as a Muslim, we have to follow the law of the land. So we are not allowed to follow Sharia law in this country. Okay, right. because we're yeah. not living in a land which follow, which allows Sharia law. Okay, and what's really interesting is in other lands... If you were living in another land, you would have your own set of laws. You're allowed yeah. to follow your own set of laws, which are set up in Muslim countries. But with us, whichever country we're in, we have to follow those laws. That's how good Islam is. Okay. You're smiling, you. which means Thank I've you. dispelled the myth. <laughs> yes, well, totally. Do. Well, it's not the myth. It's just our asking. I like to go to to the horse rather than do you know what I mean, and get yes. the, and get the real information. So, yes. you know, no, you it's of, really like, good. You hear very, very, very good things questions. on the news and in media, and you know, you always Can have sort of like a, a, a second thought. Yes, I think yes. Tarek's got a question. Yes, I've got a question. Uh, I thought that uh, if somebody who steals in a in a Sharia law country, which is not many in the world, say practicing that, if they repent after they've 
committed uh, theft of bread or food and they're in poverty, I thought that they could repent and avoid the hand being chopped. Am I wrong about that? Yes, you can do. It all depends on the circumstance. And also, it's really important to look at the law of the land. So some laws, uh, you know, uh, they've changed it according to man-made laws. So, um, in fact, some laws around that is if the person is in poverty, you actually give money to the family as well. You actually give money to the family and release that person. So it's not all that bad. What you hear is the ultimate really bad, bad stuff which is what's portrayed out there, but it isn't that bad. And it's a deterrent in the fir first place to stop you doing it. Okay, that's a very valid point there. Well done. Anything else? I liked what Joanna asked, actually. So I have no more questions. They, they can, if you've got any questions, put it in the chat and then hopefully um, yes. um, yeah, Sidra you. can ans answer them maybe later. We can respond later. Yes, okay. Really good session though, thank you. I've learned that's a lot. Suggesting you. Oh, that's really great to hear. I liked having you as well. Oh, I like your little claps. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know you could do that on Teams. Yeah, yeah it's there, yeah, it's there. Yes. Oh, are you done a clap as well? <laughs> yeah, it's there. It's interesting. I like, well, we, we like your, your, your presentation. Very, very interesting. Yeah, it's good. Really, really I like good. it. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to cover all the taboos, but I've done the main one about terrorism yeah. and the women. A lot. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. That's yeah. okay. So if we haven't got any more questions, so thank you everyone for coming. And above all, we say thank you very much, Sidra. Always interesting, always, always, you know, um, interesting topics um, to talk about. And there's so much to talk about and we are learning. You know, I enjoy your your everyone enjoy your 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 sessions. So thank you so much. So hopefully we we'll see you again soon. Yes, um, thank you so much. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Thank you yeah, very much. Thank you so thank much. You. Thanks everyone. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone. Thank bye. you. Thank you. Bye. Thanks all. Thank bye. You. Bye, bye everybody. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you so much, Sidra. Okay. Then. Thank, thank you, you so much. much. Thank bye you. Bye. Thank bye. you. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you so much. See you soon. Bye bye. Bye. Thanks.